battling the relentlessly negative doom and gloom news media. It's the Nick Stenger Show. Coming to you live from the Stenger Family Office Headquarters, it's your host, Nick Stenger. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Nick Stenger Show. My name is Nick Stenger. We are the Stenger Family Office. For the past 42 long years, it's been our mission to deliver both clarity and confidence to help secure your financial future. Welcome back. It's episode 126. So glad you have chosen to join us week in and week out to get the clarity, the confidence, the good news, the reasons, math and statistics and data why you should stay on your long-term plan. The bears, the doom and gloom pundits, the chicken little sky is falling folks are coming out of the woodwork demanding that the market has to go back down and they claim that just like gravity what must go what goes up must come back down and while that works with the laws of the universe it does not apply to the stock market just because stocks are up 15 percent roughly like they are today for 2023 does not mean that stocks have to go sliding backwards the other way way. So do not buy into this doom and gloom. Just remember, and I'm going to put out another client corner video very soon that's going to be called Don't Believe Everything You Hear. You have to always understand what people are trying to sell you. Everybody's got something to sell. And when you hear what they have to say, just fact check that against what they're trying to sell you. If somebody's trying to sell you financial planning and investment management and they're a financial a fiduciary financial advisor who's going to try and keep you on a plan, that's great. They're trying to keep you on a plan that's going to last 5, 10, 15, 25 years. And so that's a long-term goals-based analysis of where you're at. If somebody is trying to sell you gold or silver, don't be surprised if they're trying to scare the pants off you because what they want you to do is sell your stocks and buy their gold and silver bars. So just remember what people are trying to sell. If somebody's selling you bunkers full of canned foods, Uh, That should be an indication that maybe they think the world's coming to an end, or at least they want you to believe that. My advice, and you know this, 126 episodes now, has been that things will be just fine over the long run, that stocks will be up five years from today, three years from today, while none of us know what stocks are going to do on a day-to-day or month-to-month or week-to-week basis. Most of us don't know, consistently at least. I believe stocks will be higher three years years from today. And why is that, you may ask? Well, the answer is simply because their earnings, I believe, will be higher three years from today, five years from today, 10 years from today. The question you have to ask yourself is McDonald's. Is McDonald's going to make more money five years from now or less? Is Apple going to make less money from iPhones in five years uh, uh, today or more? You have to ask yourself these questions because remember, yes, stocks, while volatile in the short term, can make you nervous and make us panic sometimes in the long run they are a claim on real assets and it's like benjamin graham said who was one of warren buffett's mentors and wrote one of the most prolific investment books of all time the intelligent investor just like he wrote that in the short term stocks are a voting machine in the long run stocks are a weighing machine What does that mean? Well, in the long run, stock prices either go up or down based on how competent their management teams are, how good they are at producing their products and services. Those are the things that drive valuations over time. So do not panic. Don't buy into this doom and gloom Wall Street nonsense. Uh, And by the way, I won't name any names on this show today. You can go look it up yourself if you want. But one of the biggest bears on Wall Street, one of the, the Wall Street's one of Wall Street's biggest companies, quite frankly, and one of the most famous bears at that company, has been wrong so long. He's been wrong for 10, 12 years now. He finally got the call right last year in 2022 when he said the market would go down. A normal market correction, market was down 20% in 2022. He said the same thing in 2023. And and look, I get it. There's four months of baseball left to play here in in, uh, this year. But Even so, I highly doubt, and a lot of people are getting fed up with him now, I highly doubt that we are going to go into a tailspin for the rest of 2023. Now, could we have a correction or a short-term 5 or 10% pullback before we ultimately go back up to new record all-time highs? 
Sure, but you have to listen to the portfolio managers, not the strategists. And this goes back to understand what people are selling before you listen to what they say. If you're listening to a strategist, a strategist or a market timer or a trader is somebody who goes on the news on CNBC or Fox Business and they have a narrative to tell. They are trying to tell a story and then back it up with the data they find. They call that confirmation bias so that they already have come in with a biased opinion on where they think things are going to go. And then all of the data and all the, the charts and math and statistics, statistics they point to is just designed to back up their already uh, uh, agreed upon conclusion that the world's coming to an end. Well, we've been the opposite of that. We have taken the data at face value. Now, obviously, we have an opinion, of course, but we take the data at face value and we tell you what we think. And and so that's that's really helped us over the past five, six, seven years now, especially going through these volatile political times where uh, all of our clients that like Donald Trump, who were sad to see him go and they were upset to see Joe Biden come into office, we said, don't panic. Don't freak out. Don't worry. Uh, uh, Joe Biden's just the president. He doesn't run America's 500 largest companies, the S&P 500. Stay invested. And if Joe Biden comes and goes and you really like Joe Biden and you don't want to see a Republican in office, don't panic. It's not going to be the end of your portfolio. It's not the end of the world. We have to call balls and strikes based off of the math. And, and that's where we're at today. So don't buy into the narrative. Follow the people that actually run money, the portfolio managers, the people that actually have to put a dollar to work. And chances are the people that put money to work on a regular basis in equities in the stock market are going to be right. The market favors optimism over time. It's like Nick Murray said, optimism is the only realism. And if you look at the United States today, we've never been more prosperous. We've never had a better environment for business and entrepreneurs. And yeah, we've got problems. And yeah, there's too much regulation. And the Fed's been a little bit goofy with their policy. We've talked about all that stuff. But when you really get down to it, things are pretty darn good. And we've got a wonderful environment for medicine. We've got a great environment for, for uh, people to, to uh, uh, launch businesses. And yeah, again, there's issues there. But by and large, if you look at the U.S. and compare us to all the other developed countries in the world, we stand out as the best. So stay invested, stay optimistic. This week's episode, Don't Turn Bearish Yet. Well, one of the big reasons that we haven't turned bearish, you go, Nick, how could you possibly stay bullish in the face of all the doom and gloom? Well, the, the main reason is because of the underlying strength of the consumer. Remember, the consumer makes up a substantial part, 70% now, of U.S. GDP, gross domestic product. And that's basically a measure of all the wealth we create as a country on an annual basis, you and I, the consumer, are 70% of that number. That's why if you look at the past 10, 15 years in, in sector returns, the number one performing sector the past 15 years now has been technology. The number two sector that's been the, the highest performing is consumer discretionary. That's the stuff you don't necessarily have to buy. It's, it's instead of you buying canned soup because you're worried of a downturn coming, you're going out and you're eating at nice restaurants, for example. That's discretionary. The third top performer is healthcare. And if you look at these trends over time, I believe in past performance, of course, is no guarantee of future results. But it's obvious to me why these three sectors have outperformed. And it's also obvious to me, in my view, why I think they're going to continue to outperform over the next 10 or 15 years, because structurally, as an economy, we favor consumerism. And obviously, that's got some problems to it. It has some issues. And, and you know, we can make it a, a we can have a debate on consumerism being an issue. But that's the reality of being an investor is you invest in consumers, companies that are geared towards helping consumers and helping companies cater towards consumers are going to do well. Again, this is my opinion. There's a couple structural forces that are going to continue to drive the bullish narrative. And I think a lot of the bears, although they've been very bearish already, uh, my opinion, you ain't seen nothing yet with that. I think they're going to get even more bearish. You're going to, you're just going to be absolutely shocked to see what happens with the bears as we go through the next six months. And there eventually will be a recession. There eventually will be a correction. And, and just like 
every other correction before, just like every other downturn or recession or anything that's happened, black swan event, whatever it might be, they are going to cry wolf and say, this is the new thing that's going to take us out. You have to decide if you're going to agree with that. These are the structural things, in my opinion, that is are going to drive the bullish narrative and going to surprise the bears. Number one is that all of the same stuff that happened in 2019, where we were pivoting towards the cloud, for example, we were getting off of legacy systems and servers, we were pivoting towards online, we were going towards online shopping, for example. If you look at your Amazon orders the past five years, I think you'll be surprised to note that your orders today from Amazon, in most cases, are up tenfold, okay? That's a structural thing. COVID accelerated that, but that's a structural thing that's built into our economy now. Um, uh, For example, all of the stuff that happened in 2019 leading up to that year into COVID is now coming back in a big way. People have cash still, they're spending it. Now they will run out of cash and they're gonna have to start pivoting towards their credit cards that's still going to drive spending. Credit card payments are actually at a a low point, which you wouldn't expect, but they are. One of the things that's starting back up now is uh, student loans, and that's going to be a a bearish narrative. They're going to say that, oh, all these kids are going to have their student loans start back up, and they're going to stop spending money. Well, I got news. The, The bulk, yes, kids spend a lot of money, and millennials spend a lot of money. The bulk of consumer spending is not done by the millennial generation. It's done by the baby boomer generation. And think about it. Just from a math standpoint, if all these millennials have to start paying off their student loans and they stop going to bars and restaurants, which I really doubt they're going to do as well, uh, but even if they slow down on their spending a couple thousand dollars a year, the baby boomers have more cash than ever. And some of these baby boomers are sitting on a couple million dollars in retirement funds, most of our clients would fall into that category, sometimes even more than that, three or four or five million. They're spending 200 grand a year. That's more than most millennials make. And so the reality is, is even with student loan payments restarting now, I don't think it's going to wipe us out. The baby boomer generation is going to continue to power forward. They're con- going to continue to go on cruises and uh, I go to Europe and, and uh, stay in nice hotels and buy new cars and all the stuff that powers the economy. And then eventually what will happen, which we are currently in the midst of, is this thing called the Great Wealth Transfer. And that's all the money that is going to be passed from the baby boomer and war generations to the millennial generation. Over the next roughly 10 years or so, uh, there is going to be about $84 trillion, this is according to UBS, $84 $84 trillion passed to the next generations through the year 2045. $12 trillion of that will be donated to charity. And so these are positive economic forces. These are forces that can't be stopped, in my opinion, maybe slowed down in the short term. But the, the, the point is, is that Apple is going to continue to sell more iPhones. Google is going to continue to sell Google ads. Microsoft is still going to get people signed up for its cloud computing systems. Amazon's still going to ship packages. And the trend of people having money is still going to be in place. Now, The divide between the richest 1% and the bottom 1%, yes, is at a very wide point. It's one of the widest points it's ever been. That is a force that has also been created not by entrepreneurs, so don't get this wrong. And and I know this is an unpopular opinion in some circles. People that want to blame the rich, they want to blame the entrepreneurs, blame the companies for creating the wealth divide. That's not the case. Yes, there's the Matthew principle that the big get bigger. That is true. That's a that's something that you can't you just have to deal with. However, the government has exacerbated the problem by printing money we don't have. The Federal Reserve allowed it to happen. They were complacent, complicit, whatever you want to call it. They went along with the ridiculous spending the past 6 years now and have created a huge mess for consumers. They've created a huge mess for the bottom 1%. Because when inflation goes up 10%, it barely touches the top 1%. But it 
really affects the bottom 1%. It's the same effect as cigarette taxes. So uh, uh, there's been numerous studies done on this that cigarette taxes actually ultimately hurt the bottom the most because as a percentage of their income, the prices have gone up too much. Same thing with gas prices, same thing with new cars, used cars, housing. Um, I talk to a lot of clients' children and they are just in absolute despair. They cannot find a house to buy. They would like to stop renting. They can't. And guess what? The other thing that's coming is as mortgage prices stay high, mortgage rates stay high, and the monthly payments stay where they're at, about $2,800 a month on average, rents are only about $2,000 a month on average. That eventually is going to reach parity, which means that rental rate per month is going to get very close to home ownership. And that's a huge problem for the bottom of the barrel. And and so you just have to, if you want to solve the problems for the wealth divide, if you want to help people out, if you want to be charitable, which we all want to do, I haven't ever met a single person that doesn't want to do all those things, helping the least of these, all of that, you've got to get the government to shrink in size. The saving grace of the economy the past 10, 15 years now, despite rising inflation, despite all these structural forces, some that we like, some that we don't like, the saving grace has been entrepreneurs creating and innovating new technology. You've got to have entrepreneurs. You've got to have technology. You've got to have the government shrink in size and the individual, the entrepreneur, grow in size for things to work out for everybody. And so uh, another phenomenon going on right now is that uh, in a way, people that don't have debt, people that aren't having to buy a new house, that don't have to take on a debt right now at a 9 or 10% interest rate that are sitting instead on cash or investments are going to see their investments rise higher and higher and higher. The risk-free rate now in cash is at least 5%. Uh, in some cases, if you buy short-term treasuries, it's 5.5%. They're they're getting a, the the one percent are getting a stimulus right now by sitting on cash. So this is not a trend you're going to reverse with government policy. You're not going to be able to reverse it with redistribution. You've got to get the government to shrink in size. If you're a liberal, if you're a conservative, you should agree on that one thing that the that the government being big is not good for the economy. That's China. It's Europe. It's Japan. And those places have had anemic growth the past 10, 15 years. The United States, where we've had our clients' money allocated, has been the shining light on the hill, the shining city on the hill. So don't lose sight of that. That's the force uh, that has to be reckoned with. It's a great thing going on. And, And so here's a really interesting example of this, that our economy now has turned from a products and manufacturing based economy. We do a lot of manufacturing. You can look at all that data too, but we've really turned from a products heavy focus or a goods focused economy to a services economy. Easy example with Apple. Apple, yes, makes iPhones, iPads, and watches, but a growing portion of Apple's revenue is now derived from Apple TV. It's derived from you storing your photos on the cloud Apple TV today has 1 billion, with a B, 1 billion paid subscribers. Service revenue now makes up 25% of Apple's revenue and 41% of gross profit on a quarterly basis. Just like Apple, a lot of large S&P 500 companies have pivoted towards reoccurring subscription-based revenues that are much more profitable and more predictable as uh, as opposed to just selling a one-time transactional good. That's a great thing as an investor. And all these companies have figured this out now. Subscription model, that's the way to go. Reoccurring revenue, that's the way to go. And by the way, consumers love it too. They like knowing on a consistent basis what they're going to pay. They don't want these big fluctuations on, you know, from month to month or from year to year, depending on what the, the product is. They like to know what they're going to pay. And I think that's going to be a wonderful thing for investors. Here's another powerful economic force that started in 2019 that's continued into 2023, believe it or not, and you may not believe it when I say it, but it's consumer deleveraging. It's consumers actually having less of their money on a month-to-month basis going to debt pay down as opposed to uh, uh, spending or to saving. And yes, we've had a drop off with saving. There was a massive spike up during COVID because the government pumped cash into the system. People didn't really need to spend it because they couldn't go anywhere and spend that money for those two years. That became excess savings. That excess savings now is coming down. But 
we're not seeing this massive spike up in leverage like we saw in 08 and 09. And, and so people are not owning, in most cases, two or three houses on adjustable rate mortgages. Uh, we've gotten that fixed with, with lending. And that was one of the good things that came out of 08 and 09 was actually people having to prove their income when they buy a house. I know, shocking, right? Um, also, uh, only being able to have maybe one house or two houses at most and not being overly leveraged. Uh, another thing is these uh, the, these teaser rates that have gone away for the most part. There's still some of that out there, but most of that's gone away. And the fact that a lot of people refied in 2020 and 2021 on their long-term mortgages. And so if you locked in 3% in 2021 for the next 15 or 30 years, whatever you decided to do, um, you are not going to have this massive concern as rates go up. And that's the difference this time around. There is a difference in this environment compared with 08 and 09. The consumers just don't have the same leverage in interest rates. I wrote an article, I think it was either last year or 2021, and it was called not your father's interest rates. And the whole point of that article was to say these interest rates, the even hikes, nobody knew how high the Fed was going to hike to. But even with some hikes, my point in that article was they're not going to affect consumers the way they did in 08 and 09. And that has been proven true. Bottom line, household debt to GDP now is 10% lower than peak 2020 levels. Consumers are in tremendously better shape today than they were leading up to 08 and 09. Okay, third structural economic force that started in 19 and 20 and has continued to 2023, and that is simply a record tight labor market. People will point to all sorts of things. We kind of covered this in the previous couple articles talking about how tight labor is and why that is. Obviously, we had some excess deaths with COVID, which are sad, awful, horrible, not only lost people to COVID itself, but obviously the, the suicide, the drug abuse, alcohol abuse wiped out an additional 1.1 million people. That's meaningful. And it's horrible. It's awful. Um, and it's wiped out a decent part of the labor market, too. Not to mention on top of it, we've also had a reduction in net migration to the U.S. And, you know, obviously we want legal immigration. We want people to come here the right way. And you talk to people who, who have come into this country legally. Uh, my, my family is an example of this. And there's a lot of our clients' families that have either come from uh, Mexico or Latin America or Europe or wherever they've come from. They've immigrated to the U.S., they're, if you've ever asked them, they're huge believers in legal immigration. The reason why is because they know that the United States is the land of the free. It's the last and best hope for the world, just like it was in the 1980s. And so we need to have immigrants. We have to. There's, there's no way that we can grow our economy on the declining birth rates, but we have got to have people that are coming to the country, the best and top talent from all over the world, that's been the, the just the unique secret sauce, I would call it, of the United States is that we're able to attract people from all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of uh, uh, belief systems. And if we share one common belief that the United States is the last and best hope, we will continue, I think, to be the world's powerhouse. And, 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 and the reason I think that is because we still have the top Chinese minds coming here, the top Japanese, the top Europeans, the top uh, Africans. Africans, the top Asians, whoever it is, they all want to be here for the most part. And they know that if they build a business in the United States, they've got the rule of law, they've got personal property rights so that they can pass their wealth on according to their wishes at the end of their lives. That is so critical. It's so important. And I, I don't think that's going to change. I think as much as the Democrats or the Republicans or whoever the political party in, in power is going to be, I think it's very hard to wrestle and get away from the fact that we're going to have to have good immigration policies to get the best people over here that want to uh, uh, build a business, essentially. That, that's going to be so important. So uh, we've got that that's caused a, a little bit of a problem for small business. It's been tough for small business to find workers at 3.5% unemployment rates. But one of the saving graces is that we're sort of at the bottom of this curve here with unemployment. And I think we, and this is not a good thing for workers, so, so don't hear me wrong. I'm not celebrating this, but this is just what I see in the economic data is that we will have some layoffs. We are going to have some people that are going to have to look for new jobs. There are companies that overhired in 2020. They overhired in 2021, uh, especially big tech, and they are going to do layoffs, not 
mass, mass scale, but they are going to have to trim some of the over hiring they did. And I'm starting to see it. We, we've had about a dozen clients now tell me they've gotten laid off. We haven't seen trends like this in a few years. And I think you're going to start to see more. If you check LinkedIn and if you're on LinkedIn at all, you can see there's a lot of posts open to work. Um, that's actually rising. Uh, just from what I see, that's rising to a level we haven't seen in about two years now. So we will have some unemployment rising. However, the good news is, is a lot of those workers are going to be able to walk into 9.8 million unfilled jobs, even if that 9.8 drops off to COVID levels, which there's z almost zero chance that will happen. That was kind of a ridiculous environment. Even if that happens, though, we're still at 5 million unfilled jobs, roughly. So, so don't panic about the labor market. That's a trend that started in 2019 and 2020, and I think it's going to continue and recover. You're also going to have, and I've said this on the past couple weeks on the podcast now, is that you're going to have some retirees who retired too soon in some cases. They, they pulled the trigger on retirement a little early, and they're starting to run out of some of that excess money they had they're going to come back to work. That's going to help labor, in my opinion, as well. You saw the CNBC report that UPS drivers are now making $172,000 per year, including benefits. Unbelievable. And these are jobs that we don't need a college degree for. Our country faces a critical shortage of skilled tradespeople. And if you look at the starting wages now for electricians, plumbers, construction workers, HVAC techs, carpenters, pipe fitters, welders, the average now exceeds $60,000 per year starting salary. If you do an IRR, a rate of return on going to, going to trade school and then maybe even starting a business and all the other things that people will do with, with those trades, your IRR on that is like 50 times higher than getting a college degree nowadays. And, and so colleges, in my opinion, are going to have to reckon with the fact that they have way blown out the cost of a college education. And, and to me, it's criminal what they've done to kids. They brought them in under the pretense of, oh, you can get this degree that there's no jobs for. We're going to charge you 200 grand to get this degree. And, and full well knowing there's no jobs that are ever going to be able to pay off off a $200,000 loan. They should have to answer for that, in my opinion. They should have to come to terms with that and, and have their federal funding pulled if they don't have a certain gra a, a, a job rate or if their, their graduates don't get an average salary over a certain threshold. I think that's a horrible, horrible thing to do to people is to bring them into these degrees that have zero chance of being able to pay off the debt. And so if you're a parent and you're facing this, you are you have a high school or a, a junior higher even, I know parents are starting a lot earlier today on this, but if you have a high schooler, for example, who's going to go to college, please, 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 please have them look at other avenues. Have them look into the trades. If they're going to go to college, just make sure whatever they study, there's an actual career path for them. There's a way for them to pay back their loans if they have to take some on. And not all college degrees are bad. You know, if you go for engineering or math and science or um, uh, you want to be a doctor or a lawyer, for example, you obviously have to go to school. But make sure you're going to a good school where you're going to come out with some actual useful skills. Because I do this all the time. I run a, a very robust intern program here at the Stenger Family Office. And, and we see a lot of kids who come to us that they, they, they've spent four years in college with no meaningful skills. They, they don't know how to use Excel very well. They don't know how to do interpersonal communication. So whatever you're, whatever you're uh, going through as a parent, if you have junior hires, high school, wherever you're at, make sure they're developing these important skills. And then make sure you do an IRR, do a rate of return assumption uh, on them getting a, a degree, for example, and what that's going to look like payoff-wise. Because if you can go to UPS, for example, and make $172,000, that's not a bad way to get started. Same thing with a lot of these trades. And I think we're going to need more of these people. We're in critical uh, uh, lack of supply. That's going to be one of these trends. It's a, it's a good thing and it's a bad thing. Having a, a tight labor market is good, but the bad news is, is that it is making it very tough. We could end up in a wage price spiral is what it's called, where wages keep going up. And because wages are higher, companies raise their prices. Because companies raise their prices, then you have to increase employee wages. That's what we don't want to get into. So we're going to have to use some technology. We're going to have to have less people go to college to get degrees, for example, that don't really have a payoff and instead go into things that are more useful, skilled-based trades. That's 
what's coming. Okay, consumer spending, we talked about it, makes 70% of the economy. And people, because of this, track what's called consumer sentiment. One of the problems with consumer sentiment surveys, though, is something called herd mentality. And this is like, you remember your mother telling you growing up, uh, just because everybody's jumping off over the cliff, would you actually jump over too? And of course, the answer should be no, but this is what happens with consumer sentiment. When people answer one of these surveys, it really doesn't describe what they're going to do in reality. You have to separate what people say versus what they do. And so people that answer these consumer surveys or any survey for that matter are usually going to say everything's terrible and awful. Why? Because in a lot of cases, they're watching the news, they're reading that recession is coming, and they're going to be bearish. But if you actually look at their behavior, they don't behave, behave bearishly. They actually are, are optimistic. Most of us are optimists, even if we don't believe that, just because of the way we live. If uh, You wouldn't walk outside your house in the morning and get in your car and drive 50 miles an hour on the, on the highway if, if you thought everything was terrible and awful. Okay, you, you just wouldn't do it. So most of us in behavior, in practice, are optimists. Same thing with companies. Be careful before you buy into these doom and gloom uh, uh, surveys from CEOs, for example, that say, oh, things are going to be bad and things are going to be terrible. They behave the same way you and I do. CEOs are really no different than regular people, and they're incentivized to say the uh, same stuff. They're incentivized to say bearish comments. It's much better to surprise to the upside than to surprise to the downside. So just be careful how much you read into these sentiment surveys. In my opinion, they actually serve as a contraindicator for, for our portfolio management processes. And that's because consumer sentiment peaked in 1999 during the tech bubble, one of the worst times to buy stocks. So you're in the height of the tech bubble. Stocks are trading for 40, 50, 60 times earnings. The stock market's way overvalued. It's in a massive bubble. And they go out and pull consumers. The University of Michigan pulls consumers. They say, how do you feel about things? And, and the consumer sentiment's through the roof. We feel great. Our stocks have never been higher. We're doing excellent. Next thing you know, you're in the tech crisis, and markets have plunged 70 80% to their lowest point, not to return to those levels until 2010, a decade later. That's why you can't rely on these surveys. By the way, at the bottom of 08 and 09, when the market was down 60%, that was one of the best times to buy stocks, and consumers were the most pessimistic they've ever been. And, and so if you watch consumer sentiment, when you get into one of these zones where people are down in the dumps and bearish, that's a great time to buy. That's a good time to be looking at buying companies rather than following it as your, as your tool to invest. Uh, right now, the Consumer Sentiment Index, and this is another, another reason I'm bullish, the Consumer Sentiment Index is 31% lower than its peak 2020 levels, which is another reason why I think you should be bullish on stocks. You should be doing the opposite. When everybody's jumping off the cliff, you should be not jumping off the cliff, hopefully, and buying stocks. People have never been more bearish about markets, especially institutional investors, the people that are supposedly smart money that you think are doing the right thing and they're buying stocks and supposed to be outsmarting the market. They're, they're in the herd. They're doing the wrong thing. They've gotten so bearish. They've got so much cash on the sidelines, in some cases more cash than they know what to do with, and they're buying treasuries because they're scared. Well, to me, that's the time to be optimistic and, and long run staying on your plan. So we've got some issues ahead of us. We've got some problems. Everybody knows that. We've always had problems as a country. But in the long run, stocks will go higher as their earnings go higher. You're an investment. Uh, you're, you're an investor. You've got your 401k, your 403b, you've got your pension, whatever you've got. You are an optimist because you know, or at least you believe, that five years from today, things will be better than they are right now. There's no reason to panic. There's no reason to, to get all overly bearish and put all of your money into treasuries or, or money market or something like that. And by the way, I will just say and preface all of this by saying I could be wrong. I could be wrong in the short term. We could see a 10% decline. You just put a million dollars in the market. You could be down a hundred grand in the short term. That's all normal part of investing. Okay. You have to get comfortable with volatility if you're going to be a successful long run investor. But over time, I'm willing to bet 
that I'll be right and that million dollars will go up over time. So stay invested, stay optimistic. We've got the wealth transfer in process. We've got more people giving more money to charity in this country than ever before. We're taking care of the least of these. We're watching out. We're doing a good job. Uh, all, everybody's going to work every day to work the problem. The companies are doing fine. We're going to have some short-term declines, could have a recession. I've seen some, some calls, which I actually agree with, in early next year. Don't let it spook you. Stay on your plan. And remember that you own equities, a claim on real assets. Thank you for being with us. If you enjoyed our content, go on our website, stengerfamilyoffice.com. Give us a call, 630-912-8431, 630-912-8431. Give us a call. If you're not using critical thinking in your investment plan, get started with the starter account. And, and our minimum today is only $1,000. It gets you in on a plan getting started with our investment philosophy. And over time, we hope to build a relationship with you that can get you in these companies that are going to beat inflation over the long run. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next week for episode 127.